This house, located in the beautiful mountain village of Asago, Japan, is free. Not free to the one millionth visitor free. Not free except for these terms and conditions free. Just free. Some of the top amenities include these ruins of a 15th century castle, a mere 20 minute scenic drive away. And everything from cherry blossom trees to a supermarket, post office, and hair salon, all within walking distance. Now, the building itself is no five star hotel. It could use more than a fresh coat of paint. But at nearly 1,400 square feet, with two stories, flush toilets, and heating, there are worse ways to spend zero dollars. More remarkable, perhaps, is the fact that this deal isn't all that remarkable. There are at least 8 million such abandoned homes across Japan. Some free and others effectively free, just waiting for someone to claim them. Maybe the island lifestyle is more your speed, in which case you might be interested in this one for about 5,000 US dollars. If you're looking to splurge a bit, this one could be yours for 11 grand. The possibilities are endless. You can have your pick between about one in every seven houses, including the land 11% of the entire country's surface area. And there's no hurry these numbers are expected to double by 2033. That's right, in just 10 years time, nearly every third Japanese home will be vacant, according to the country's largest economic research institute. And while its population is among the fastest shrinking in the world, demography alone cannot explain these strange real estate dynamics. Sponsored by CuriosityStream and Nebula. Watch my six-part exclusive series and other Nebula originals like Great Cities with the Curiosity Stream and Nebula bundle, all for just 15 bucks a year. Broadly speaking, there are two ways to make housing more affordable. Increase supply or decrease demand. Japan, uniquely, does both. For one, demography certainly doesn't hurt. Its population has been declining since 2010 and is expected to return to 1970 levels within the next 25 years. Fewer people means fewer households means fewer homes. That's on the demand side, but supply is no less important. To put it simply, Japan builds like crazy. Tokyo proper, for instance, has a population of about 14 million people. New York City, a little less than 9. But despite being only 1.6 times more populous, Tokyo built 4 and a third times as many houses in 2020. Of course, as any Californian can tell you, just build more is easier said than done. Increasing supply is threatening to the very parties responsible for its approval, neighbors, city councils, and local governments. But that's where the Japanese system excels. During the late 80s and early 90s, the country experienced a housing bubble that rivals 2008. At one point, all the land in Japan was valued four times higher than all of America despite being 26 times smaller in land area, about the size of Montana alone. After the market came crashing down, the government made changes to prevent the same thing from happening again. The tiny difference that makes all the difference is that, in Japan, land policy is now mostly set at the national, not local, level. Its Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transportation, and Tourism is less like, say, the little-known Federal Maritime Commission and more akin to the all-powerful EPA. It, rather than partial local governments or even the legislature itself, largely dictates the country's building codes, for example. Cities are only permitted to divide their land into zones the national government decides what can and can't be built in each one. 
the United States has no fewer than 22,000 sets of codes, each one with dozens of different zones. The entire nation of Japan, meanwhile, is divided into just 12, total, and any changes made to one of them applies everywhere. Another seemingly minor difference with major downstream effects is the way these zones work. While a commercial zone in America typically allows only commercial activity, things like auto repair shops, movie theaters, and strip malls, the same one in Japan also allows for non-commercial uses, like apartments and schools. What this means is that developers are free, if they want, to mix uses. That free house in Asago, for instance, is about 30 feet from a hair salon and a three-minute walk from a bookstore. In Japan, your neighbors really have no say over what you do with your property, a degree of freedom that results in some pretty quirky design choices. On the tame end of the spectrum, there's the stuff of HOA nightmares. You might find a traditional wooden house directly adjacent to a modern minimalist mansion. Then there are the truly creative ones. The gothic tomato cottages, transparent townhouses, and giant pyramids. If you can dream it, it can surely be built. One consequence is that Japan produces more architects per capita than any other country, and by a wide margin. Five times more than the UK, seven times more than America, and eleven times more than Canada. It's hard to imagine a better place for young architects to experiment than a nation of tiny homes free from concerns about neighborhood character. But wait a second. Four times as many new homes as New York? These numbers aren't just impressive. They're too impressive. Think about it this way. Here are seven large advanced economies. This is each one's total population. And this is the number of new homes each one builds in a typical year. One country clearly stands out. How can it be that Japan, with only 40% as many people, builds almost as many new homes each year as the United States? We all know California is starved for housing, but this is just crazy. The math doesn't add up. The solution to this puzzle, it turns out, lies in the number of existing homes sold. Now we can see that although the total number of homes sold in each country, both new and used, is roughly proportional to its population, there's a huge difference in composition. The vast majority of American home sales are second-hand, whereas the vast majority of Japanese home sales are brand new. In fact, if we stretch the data out, we can see that it's almost the inverse of America. And that's Japan's secret. The reason its housing market is so fundamentally different. It's not just about national control of zoning. It's also an entirely different perspective on what housing is. In most advanced economies, a house is an investment that doubles as a place to live a 401k you can sleep in. In Japan, a house is a consumer good, not unlike a car or a refrigerator, that rapidly depreciates in value. In a mere 30 years, the typical Japanese home goes from brand new to about as valuable as a CD player in 2023. That's no exaggeration. According to the Ministry of Land, even a reinforced concrete apartment has a lifespan of just 37 years. Try to sell your house on the 38th year, and banks will tell you it's worth zero dollars. Or less, since the building has to be demolished before a new one can be built. As you can see here, used homes depreciate, on average, over twice as fast in Japan as in the US. One reason for this is relatively straightforward. Earthquakes. Not only do they destroy homes, but they require periodic updates to building codes to better prepare for the next one. Newer buildings are considered much safer. Another reason has to do with history. 
Nearly a third of urban Japanese homes were bombed during the Second World War, creating a shortage of 4 million units. And when private banks were unable to keep up with demand for mortgages, the government was forced to step in. Starting in June of 1950, generously subsidized interest rates were offered to anyone in need of a home. These millions of dollars of stimulus, redirected from the war, helped pay for nearly 20 million units by 2007. But this overwhelming success came with an unintended side effect. In the rush to house war-torn Japan, building standards, even those of the 1950s, were haphazardly overlooked. These were cheap wooden houses with poor insulation and sometimes major structural flaws. Because of this, they tended to last just three or four decades before they had to be completely destroyed and rebuilt from the ground up. The end result was a persistent, widespread practice that lasts to this day. The quality of today's homes, of course, hardly resembles those of 1950. There's no reason any built this decade, if well cared for, couldn't survive well beyond 30 years. But because they're valued like fragile consumer goods, owners have little incentive to put in the necessary maintenance, turning the 30-year lifespan into a self-fulfilling prophecy. Meanwhile, until 2015, homeowners had little incentive to demolish any houses they weren't living in thanks to another legacy of World War II. Also to increase the supply of housing, small residential plots were taxed 80% less if they contained a structure. That 1,400 square foot home from earlier would be taxed at just $75 a year, for example. It's exactly these kinds of seemingly minor historical details that shape the cities we live in today. And in great cities, Dave from City Beautiful explains how, for Shanghai, Canberra, and Paris. Great cities, like my six-part series China Actually, along with dozens of others on topics like urbanism, politics, and modern history, are exclusively available on today's sponsor, Nebula. Signing up to Nebula is the absolute best way to support independent creators like Polymatter, and the cheapest way to get access is with the CuriosityStream bundle, using the link in the description. After signing up to CuriosityStream for just 15 bucks a year, you'll get an email with instructions on how to get free access to Nebula. On CuriosityStream, you can watch feature-length documentaries, like this one about how a single bridge forever changed Japan. Click the link on screen right now to get both Nebula and CuriosityStream from your $15 a year.